So can you see the screen? Just checking. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. So I thought I'd just quickly start um, why I started to look into Moodle theme development. Um, I'm just going to minimize that. Um, I, I've basically been working as a web developer for the last 12 years. I joined the college in December 2019, just before the pandemic. And our college was uh, just starting a branding refresh project. And of course, the accessibility regulations were just about to come in. And it was becoming clear as I learned more about accessibility and how to test for it, that we would need to update a Moodle theme for accessibility reasons, as well as branding ones. Um, when we were going through it, we discovered we had problems with the screen reader, reading things out of order. There was some poor color contrast going on. Um, some, of the, some of the links didn't have focus um, when you were navigating by keyboard um, and skipped content uh, links were missing. Um, although I knew it would be a lot of work at the time, um, I wanted to learn how to code and maintain my own theme for Moodle um, because I felt that would allow us to be more responsive to any changes needed for accessibility or otherwise. Also means we don't have to wait for um, third party providers to write an update to code when we discover a problem um, or we want to add a new feature, we can just start working on it. Um, so, um, I just wanted to quickly mention um, that there's been some new courses come into on Moodle Academy, which didn't exist when I first started. Um, I would definitely recommend if anyone's thinking of looking into uh, theme development to actually have a look at these courses and go through them, particularly the plugin development one. And as that one, um, as plugins um, and themes are actually pretty similar. And uh, I started a wee bit different. Um, I she's just started delving into the Moodle developer documentation where they've got, there's this whole section on themes and they've got a tutorial about creating a theme based on Boost. Um, this, is, um, this is essentially creating a child theme um, with Boost as the parent. Now, I'm just going to give a very, very quick overview of the components of a Moodle theme. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here because it's an absolutely massive subject. And I think the Moodle Academy course and the Moodle documentation covers it way better than I can, just over 20 minutes. Um, so I've got just a screenshot of the, the basic structure. Um, you've got a version file um, that specifies the version of the theme, lowest version of Moodle that the theme requires in order to run, a uh, component name of the theme and any dependencies it needs. Um, you've got a configuration file. This is where you can set things like a readable name for the theme. It's also where you can set up the theme renderer factory, which um, enables the theme to override core template files and um, some of the renderers. Um, you can have a settings file. This is where you can set up any additional settings that your theme needs. Um, for example, it could have a background image setting or brand color settings. Um, if set, these settings can then be found in the site administration area of Moodle. Uh, there'll be a lib file, and this will be a library of functions your theme uses. These can include references to stored files from theme settings or theme render overrides. For those that don't know, because I'm not being a bit technical here, um, theme renderers are PHP classes that determine the output. Mm. Overrides can then be used to override the default core renderers to produce a modified or different output to what Moodle produces. I do try to use the render overrides quite sparingly because they can be a bit more involved to keep updated as Moodle gets updated. Um, you've got a language folder. This is where all your theme language strings for any languages you support, including your default one like English, 
um, are stored. You can then create separate versions for different translations, like Italian, French, Spanish, whichever language you want to support. Um, there's a templates folder. Um, this is where you can put um, your moustache files in. Um, for those that don't know, moustache is a logicless template system that Moodle uses. Um, it allows us to create HTML templates with placeholder strings that Moodle will then replace with rendered information. For example, you could have a template for a course page header. Um, Moodle would take this and fill out the placeholder for the course title with the title of the course you have navigated to. Um, you can find these moustache templates throughout Moodle's core folders and files, and they will end in dot moustache. Um, if you want to override them, you can then create a copy into the theme template folder and modify it. This is much preferable to doing a render override because it's a lot easier to maintain. And finally, you've got your um, style sheets. Um, Moodle currently uses SCSS, which is a pre-compiler for creating CSS. Um, CSS will control the styling of the theme and uh, are compiled from the SCSS files. Um, one of the main advantages of this is you can set variables for things like colors, typography, font sizes in the pre.scss file. And then you can just reference these in the post.scss file, which means if these ever change, you only have to change them in one place. It's also worth noting that the core boost theme is built using Bootstrap 4. Bootstrap 4 has its own set of variables, um, which you can also change to fit in with your design or brand. And you can find a list of these in the Bootstrap documentation. So having very briefly gone over the programming side of things, I thought I'd just talk a bit about how I approach designing features of any website or application. Um, my degree was in interactive media design, which covered how people interact with technology and was quite big on thinking about your users first and how they use the application you're building. As something that I feel is very important to have in mind when planning, coding or designing anything. And it's also quite true for making interactions accessible. Um, so I was thinking a bit about our users Globally, just over half of website visits now come from mobile devices. And we became very aware during the pandemic that many of our students only have access to a mobile phone. Um, so I already knew when I was like, working on this that we needed to make sure that it was responsive and could be accessed on a mobile. Um, I also had to consider our geographic area. We're the third largest council area in Scotland. And we cover a really large rural area, which has quite a lot of connectivity issues and black spots. Um, so I had to consider, like I had to keep the theme as light as I could just to try and um, help with, in, with loading times. And of course we had to consider accessibility functionality. So we had to think about how people with various disabilities from low vision, color blindness, or hearing loss, would, might use the VLE. So I had to consider that when building the theme. So I thought I'd just put in some stats of why it's important to make these things um, accessible. About 15% of the world's population have some sort of disability. Um, it's about 80 million people in the EU and roughly one in five people in the UK have a disability. It's also bearing in mind that issues with vision and hearing and mobility can become more common with age. And this is quite important to think about given that we do have older adults retraining at our college. And um, finally, making your website or application accessible can also improve it for all users, not just those with disabilities. 
Um, the obvious ones are obviously um, video. It can then be watched in a noisy or very quiet environment. Um, color contrasts make it a lot easier to read for everyone. And good keyboard navigation can help users who maybe have a temporary injury, like a broken arm. I also quite like this quote um, that Tim Cook made about making Apple devices um, accessible. So when I'm when I'm designing and building various features, I will be thinking about how users are using going to use the feature. Is it understandable when you can't see it? Is it understandable when you can see it? And does that experience change on different devices? And I've gradually been building up a few ways of testing for accessibility while I'm while I'm building and coding. Um, so the easiest way um, is just using your keyboard um, and seeing if you can tab, shift tab, and move through the content and interact with everything. I actually just did a little screen recording of doing exactly this. And then sort of using the tab to tab through things. And you can use shift tab to go back. Um, you can use your arrow keys to scroll up and down. I do show this somewhere. <laughs> um, you can also keep an eye out for things like um, making sure you don't end up in a keyboard trap. Um, this can happen with pop-ups sometimes. Um, where the focus doesn't shift to that pop-up, it can make it impossible to interact with the content of that pop-up or, or get out of it. I've also, you can also use browser plugins to review. So there's the Wave browser extension, um, which is very useful for flagging up problems um, or potential problems. Um, you've also got the Google Lighthouse Accessibility Report in Google Chrome. Um, this will actually provide you with a list of any problems that it's spotted when it scans it. And that's just baked into Google Chrome. Um, it is worth bearing in mind, though, that um, it, some of these, it, some of these things, it can't tell you if um, it can't always tell you if the color contrast, for instance, is right, and it can't always tell you if elements are being read in an understandable order. So it's worth checking manually. Um, there's also some browser plugins you can use just to simulate how a page might be perceived in certain conditions. So I'm just using one of these here um, just to show how the page changes if you've got certain types of color blindness. It's a good way of just checking the content is understandable when, when you can't perceive it all colors. It's also got in um, a few options for checking how readable is when you've got tunnel um, tunnel vision or and there's also a screen reader simulator in here which will actually read out the content as you're going through it so fast forward for a little bit um, finally you can also use the accessibility tools that are baked into your operating system MacOS, for instance, has voiceover and voice control built into it. Um, voiceover acts as a screen reader and reads out text while you're navigating by keyboard. Um, voice control can allow you to navigate using voice commands. Um, I, iOS also includes voiceover and voice control, so you could do that on a mobile as well. Um, there's some good videos online showing how to use them. And I believe Windows and Android also have accessibility tools built into them. I haven't actually used these all that much, 
Um, although I am planning on looking into what's available for Chromebooks, um, because that's what a lot of our students use. So I've just, this is just a we, um, screen recording of me using voiceover on the MacOS. And what it's actually doing is it's reading through the content, which you can see in the bottom bottom left. So it's actually reading that out loud. You can't hear it at the moment, but. And finally, I'd say that when you're working on something like theme development, you want to be regularly testing and looking for improvements to make, including accessibility. Our college focuses on long-term stable releases. Um, so it's going to be a while before we upgrade to Moodle 4, although I am planning on working on an update for Moodle 4 so we can be ready for the next long-term stable release. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I am looking forward to seeing what changes they've made in terms of user interface. I've built up um, a list, a page of links if anyone's interested, and I'm also happy to share if anyone would like them. I hope some of that was useful. I haven't bored you too much. Um, and I didn't talk too fast, or probably did. 